All right. Well, welcome everybody to Solar Noon Tuesday. I'm Jay Warmke with Blue Rock Station. And as per normal, what we'll do is I'll go through the uh, week's events in, in the solar world first, brief recap. And then um, we'll do an update on upcoming webinars and the like. And then we have a guest today, uh, Bill Dorsett, and we'll talk about uh, some of the activities that he's doing in Kansas around uh, basically solar barn raising type projects. So, um, and then the folks who are on the line here, um, if you have a question, feel free to jump in. Uh, I do ask that if you've got the ability to show video, that's helpful because these videos do get posted. And if you're not speaking or whatever and there's background noise, then if you could just turn off the mic. So anyway, we'll jump into the news of the week for the week of January 28th. Um, China now accounts for over 40% of all of the solar installed worldwide. Um, the U.S. is second with about 12%. And China is on a pace, even though it accounts for 40%, it looks to double over the next three years. It took 13 years for China to get to 500 gigawatts of installed capacity. And they're anticipating by the end of 2026, it'll be up to one terawatt. Uh, last year, 2023, China installed 217 gigawatts of solar. Now that compares to the entire installed base within the United States of around 175 gigawatts. So in 2023, China installed more than exists within the United States. The Energy Information Administration, EIA, um, is projecting that renewables are gonna be the big winner uh, over the next two years when it comes to electric generation. Hydro, they're looking at um, adding about 24.3 megawatt hours of capacity. Wind, about 46.3 megawatt hours. And solar, they're looking that we will then add another 123 megawatt hours of solar. Natural gas is gonna continue to grow, uh, but fairly modestly at about 12 and a half megawatt hours. And nuclear even will add some capacity with about 21 megawatt hours of capacity there. The big loser is coal, coal powered generation. And they're looking that about 117 megawatt hours of generating capacity will be um, retired. Now utility scale solar in the US is anticipated to grow at about a 75% rate over the next two years. And by the end of 2026, we'll see that renewables here in the United States account for about 25% of all of the uh, generated capacity for electricity. Now, in 1936, only about 10% of all of the homes, all of the rural homes within the United States had any kind of electricity. So as part of the New Deal, uh, the Roosevelt administration set up the Rural Electrical Co-op uh, program. And today, about 42 million um, Americans get their power through rural co-ops. Now, this represents only about 15% of the households, but co-ops serve 56% of the land mass within the United States. Um, but these co-ops tend to lag far behind when it comes to the adoption of renewable energy. In fact, they have almost no wind and solar as part of their generating portfolio. Uh, on As a whole, co-ops get their power 54% from coal, 34% um, from natural gas, and 11% from nuclear. So only 1% of their generating capacity comes from renewable energy. Um, some of this in the past is because uh, as a nonprofit, they could not take advantage of any of the tax benefits uh, from installing um, renewable energy. Uh, so they just didn't. But under the new IRA, uh, there's a program within that, the Inflation Reduction Act, called New Era. Uh, it's That stands, all these cute acronyms, Empowering Rural America. That's what ERA stands for. Well, there's $10 billion of grant money there to help co-ops become more renewable. Well, so far, they've received about 157 applications for this money. And if it was all built, would represent about $93 billion of public and private investment in renewable energy for, um, for the electrical co-op. So it looks like they're going to be catching up relatively quickly. 
Plus, in addition to this program, the IRA has the um, uh, provision that nonprofits can indeed get their tax benefits in the form of a rebate. So, um, so that's going to be taken advantage of outside of this uh, new era program there in, within the uh, IRA. And uh, so I've told you the good news, bad news, it doesn't apply to everybody, but Solar Edge is cutting about 16% of its global workforce. Um, that represents about 900 employees. Uh, Solar Edge basically had a dismal year in 2023. Um, so they're closing their manufacturing capacity in Mexico. They're reducing a lot of it in China. Um, in 2023, revenues for the company fell about 13.3% while costs increased about 13.7%. And um, trying to meet somebody here. All right, I'll get you. Um, okay, so um, anyway, the um, stock fell, or net profits, I should say, fell within SolarEdge by about 385%. So that's a bad year. And their stock prices fell in February from $344 to about $71 uh, a share right now. Now, the company is blaming high interest rates and um, supply chain disruptions. They're saying that this is a, um, this is a, um, a market correction that because of these high interest rates and supply chain disruptions, what had been an overheated residential solar market uh, has um, cooled off significantly. And uh, that's what's um, dealing with them. Uh, although Enphase, their major competitor, has not seen the same kind of reductions, they have seen some reduction. Uh, and there's another factor in this. And although uh, Solar Edge, which is headquartered in Israel, uh, claims that the, uh, the Israeli-Hamas conflict that's happening over there has no impact on this. Uh, but I guess I just uh, would take that with a grain of salt. It seems like it would have to have some impact. And there's an industry group comprised of Google, Microsoft, AES, and Constellation. They've created a new rec marketplace. Um, these... Um, this REC or Renewable Energy Certificate is going to be, uh, this marketplace is going to be up and running in 2024. Uh, this is for corporate buyers and utilities to purchase if they want to increase their renewable energy portfolio. Uh, there are these marketplaces, but they're a bit not transparent and a bit difficult to navigate. So this new one is going to be operating 24-7, so always open. And the other significant thing about it is if you buy a REC, it will indicate where that power is being generated and when. So, so it's very transparent in where that power is coming from. And that's the news um, from the solar industry for this week. Did anybody have any um, other tidbits they wanted to add before I jump into some of the events coming up? I, I just... can't help think that part of the problem with Solar Edge is if you remember correctly, it took them three shots to get me a inverter that actually worked. Yeah, yeah, they were having a lot of problems with uh, with their yeah. inverters, and and that was um, because they had outsourced them, I think, to Turkey and Romania as part of the construction thing. Uh, and although some of the installers I've spoken with say that has worked through that they don't have the same problems they used to have. But, you know, as they always say, a reputation takes years to build and, and, and an hour or a minute to destroy. So, um, you know, I, I would shy, I personally shy away from them just for that reason that they have a history of, of problems there, but that may be an unfair characteristic today. All right. Any other uh, comments on the news? Okay, well, let me jump into some of the events that are coming up here. Uh, January 30th, that's today, 2 p.m., um, there's a webinar about uh, CEAs, uh, the Solar Energy Industry Association. They have a diversity certification, so it's an update on progress being made there. February 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern, all these times are going to be Eastern time. Uh, what's the proper way for utilities to report grid outages uh, under the new rulings? February 7th, there's a renewable energy market predictions. Uh, that one sounds kind of interesting. 
And February 13th, there's a webinar about three-dimensional trackers and ground-mounted systems to deal with the contours of the land uh, as that moves forward. Uh, this is one that just popped up, selling solar um, using artificial intelligence. So that's on February 15th. So if you're in sales, uh, that sounds like an interesting one. And uh, February 20th, recruiting and retaining veterans within solar. Uh, there's a NABCEP conference coming up in Raleigh, North Carolina, March 18th through the 21st. And then we've got our solar programs on um, solarpvtraining.com. So there's online and face-to-face. -face. There's a number of face-to-face uh, -face um, courses coming up if you're looking at getting certified. And that is what came across my desk as far as um, upcoming events or webinars. Uh, again, I'll just open it up to folks. Uh, do you have anything you want to add to that before we welcome Bill Bill Dorset in here to discuss his project? Okay, no. All right. Well, Bill, um, why don't um, I'll I'll uh, bring you on and you can unmute yourself there and uh, just tell us a little bit about the project that you're working on. Okay. Hey, we are, we started a cooperative and, and about 12 years ago, uh, I'd been installing PV for a number of years before, but it was about time to retire. So instead of letting our, our wholesale accounts just go blank, we decided we'd let friends of mine just start buying in bulk and, and, and then dividing the cost a little bit like a vegetable buyers group. And I, before we go any further, I've got another friend, one of our coordinators who is on this, on this line with us. His name is Robert Rosenberg. And so I'll invite Robert to kick in wherever he, wherever he sees fit. Um, Thank you. We, we do, let me see if we can put this on the slideshow mode. There we go. Okay. These are some of our installations and we just have what and we and it, it's not an original idea. This is this was originally taken from a group in Rhode Island. It was the Plymouth Area Renewable Energy Initiative, Perry. And I'll give them the credit. They were in those days only involved in in doing solar thermal evacuated tube collectors. And I'd been more interested in PV. It seemed like it would be easier to run wires than, than run plumbing. And so we started just doing systems. And at this point, we've done about 130 systems here in just the Manhattan area, uh, just in north central Kansas. Um, we generally, our goal is to expand or reduce we were going, our mission statement was to reduce the barriers to solar. And that's comp, it's really taken directly from Perry's uh, mission statement also. And we vet the hardware for quality and we do public education, both of government officials and other people, uh, people just people who come to classes that we teach. And we work with tradespeople to develop the skills for installing arrays. and. Buying in bulk, we can reduce the cost tremendously. And then we just organize um, friends and neighbors and other people to come by and help us install the system. And we, this is not the whole system. Let me be clear that we're, we're not doing, we only put the array up and leave a junction box typically on the end of a, of a rail and then have the people hire an electrician. We usually recommend somebody that we've worked with before to, you know, to go ahead and do the home run and, and work inside the, the breaker panel and, and that type of thing. And it's... Although we could do that, and and uh, we we can, uh, yeah, do the yeah. final hookup. Just that uh, the utility company prefers that it's signed off by a licensed electrician. It, that applies mostly to the rural electrics that's surrounding Manhattan. Um, this is our most recent price estimate as to what we can, we can sell a system for. And 
these are we're going to and we we try to stay within the the dnv or the pval uh recommendations of the most reliable panels we that's where we combine our buying at this point we're looking at jinko panels and this is the cost that we can we can put a system we can sell all the hardware for now this includes the typical utility fees and the electricians charge for doing the home run. Uh, so our cost is actually a little bit less than this. Um, you know, so in a typical system is probably in the range of 18 to 20, 20 panels, uh, probably somewhere in this range. So it's about 9,200 mm -hmm. about $9,300 for, a uh, for the whole, the whole system installed by the inverter or the electricians. Hey, Bill, does that cost uh, include, are, are all of the labor that you're providing, is that all donated labor or uh, do you guys charge for that? And is that inclusive? And and does no. this just include the racking and the panels or does this include like the end phase combiner box and, and all of that? We haven't used combiner boxes at this point because it's difficult to integrate the, the consumption monitoring. So we, it's hard to put it on the outside of the house and still have the cables connecting to the the uh, L1 and L2 going into the breaker panel. So we haven't we haven't used combiner boxes typically, at and you know we've well to answer your question we that includes everything nuts and bolts, uh, <clears throat> it, that price includes includes everything. the The reason the thirteen is highlighted slightly is because. That fits neatly in two uh, 20 amp breakers. So we you know, that's a system. And our labor is volunteer. So the only thing the co-op takes is a is an overhead. Go ahead, Bill. You hey, can explain overhead. Robert, <laughs> Robert, that's an excellent. Good. Thank you for throwing that in. No, we have we typically charge 15% just to cover our insurance and just our, our business operations. Uh, advertising and and then at the end of the year we usually contribute fairly sizably to the local environmental groups um, CR club and 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 Earth Justice and other people who have who've really helped us in 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 the contentious problems that we've had with the Kansas legislature over the years uh, so we've you know we feed back into different charitable groups here too so okay. that, yeah. it looks like it looks like from that chart that you're coming in at around two dollars a watt versus the traditional three dollars or three plus um, for for a regular for profit installer. Does that sound yep. right? That it sounds depends, about right. It depends, Jay, on on how big the system is. Obviously, like if you look at the at the the top row there, there's four panels. Yeah. And just because there's a fixed, you know, there's a certain fixed cost. There's the the breakers and the lightning arresters and and the home run going back to the the breaker panel and all the other stuff. That's a fixed cost regard that's fairly fixed regardless of the size of the system. Yeah. So whether you have two strings, uh, two branches of end phase inverters or whether you have one branch, it you have the same fixed cost. So there's a variable cost and then the fixed cost. The next slide will show you that. But as you look, as you go down into bigger systems, the fixed cost factors into it much less. So down here at the bottom, you know, with 24 panels, you're talking, or with two, yeah, with 24 panels, you've got a dollar fifty. Is it would be the cost per watt, and that's after after rebate or after incentives. Yeah. Yes, right? yes. After tax means after the tax credit. Yeah, yeah. Rebate. So these are the things no. that we have. And it's remarkable also in that Manhattan has a fairly high income or sales tax. Our sales tax is close to 10%. And it also includes shipping. So so those costs are the variable costs that, you know, depend on those things will increase the more panels that you have. But then the fixed costs are like the monitor, the envoy, lightning arresters, the disconnects and things like that. So... We provide all those things in that in that price, and it depends on who the who the utility is that you're connecting to as to what the utility fees are. I think I just factored in maybe 
Oh, 300 or $200 on that. So it, we're talking about Evergy as in terms of the fees for Evergy and, and the, um, and the, the building permits and things like that. So that's just, this is just to give people an idea of what their overall cost will be. We've had, you know, we've had great luck and we've had, we've had, you know, we do, have some safety concerns and we are sure you know that we want to put a scaffolding up we don't put up systems on roofs that are over two story or single story roofs and not not on roofs that are really steep simply because we're working with volunteers um but there's some disadvantages of what we have one is that you know it's not like a, a vegetable buyers group and that we don't have very many repeat customers um, you know, once they put it in, it's pretty much in. And so it's it's been kind of difficult to maintain a membership list and a leadership uh, into the future. And part of that is because there's no liability, there's no insurance company who's going to insure amateurs working on the roof doing, quote, electrical work, even though we're not, you know, a microinverter is never active until it until you plug it into the, the final breaker. Yeah, uh, let me jump in again. Um, it, two of the things that occurred that that made us, that made, well, Bill start this co-op is uh, one of them is is the, the when the microinverters came out and we didn't have to work with high voltage DC, we, uh, Bill decided, you know, this is safe enough for volunteers. And the second thing is, is that the local uh solar contract or solar installers charge two and three times the cost of the hardware so it was a barrier mm -hmm. exactly we've done like i said we've done about 130 systems in this area of of kansas and in 2022 we 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 provided about three hundred and twenty thousand dollars worth of solar hardware to people and this year we we've really been preparing to to diversify and go into the solar for all and we're trying to to narrow our focus down into families who can not otherwise afford it and so we're we're doing we haven't really been out selling this year that we, like we did in 2022 and so this year we've sold maybe 45 to 50 thousand dollars and part of that was because our management was dispersed we need a committed long-term and skilled management team to be able to to really organize and keep this going at at the you know 300 i suspect i suspect that we could do a million dollars a year we've done all of our business with no advertising it's all been strictly word of mouth and our, and recently our website but we if we advertised and we promoted this thing we could probably sell a million dollars a year but again, we have to have somebody who is a management team and we probably have to figure some other way of, of doing the, the installations because, you know, as a co-op with volunteers, we can do systems maybe on every Saturday or every Sunday, but then some Sundays are, are icy and cold in Kansas. So reality is we can't get anywhere near 52 systems, uh, you know, a year. So we're looking at this big pile of, and it's kind of indigestible pile of money. I mean, I look at it, it's only gonna go for four to five years uh, with the solar for all project uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act. So we're looking at probably 3,000 to 6,000 small arrays in Kansas over this next five years. And we just don't have, we don't have the train, we don't have the skilled, um, installers to be able to put this type of the to to devote the time and the effort to put that much uh, that much that many panels up um i mean it was we were having one of the people who applied for this grant or the the, the solar for all grants was talking about um i mean it was something in the range of 46 containers full of panels and there's just going to be a huge competition for the limited um, amount of quality hardware nationwide, and especially if it's confined to, you know, Buy America products, that's going to be really difficult to come up with. So we're training, we're 
we're working this year to train. These are exiting soldiers from Fort Riley, which is about, oh, five miles down the road from us. And these guys are getting out of the army and they're learning trades. And so they're training in this case through a company called HBI, or the Home Builders Institute, for training to put in on solar panels. And it's not all of their curriculum. They're also learning carpentry and 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 electrical and and this is part of their electrical curriculum. And if anybody has questions, please don't hesitate to jump in and ask. We started, Freak has also started working with Habitat for Humanity. Um, and it's a coalition of people. There's the there's a, a net positive design studio from Kansas State University, and then the local uh, county habitat, and then like I mentioned, the habitat or the Home Builders Institute is one group that we've been working with, and the Manhattan Area Technical College and Job Corps has been on the periphery of what we're doing simply because they have so many restrictions working with different federal grants and federal programs and it's difficult to get past all of that and then of course us the flint hills renewable energy cooperative and so these are these are different pictures of us helping and putting up systems hey bill do you require when somebody has a system installed on their home do you ask them then to participate as a volunteer on future installs <laughs> Jay, it's been difficult to do that because it, 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 if someone, and we, we have this problem with insurance and, <clears throat> and liability. If we require people to be up on the roof, then it makes us doubly responsible. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of have dodged that. We, we've suggested it and we've even gone to the point, to the point of saying occasionally that, uh, that, that we will schedule their their build after they've helped a couple of other people, you know, and then they could pay it forward. Okay. Um, so, but that's been a sticky point for us for some yeah. time. <clears throat> some people just aren't capable of doing it, but they they want to help. They generally um, we wouldn't you say we vet our our customers by y y their willingness to to be on board. Um, uh, one of the reasons we're, we're, we want to work with Habitat, Habitat for Humanity is to get away from the people that just you know, treat us like an installer and um, a free installer, you know, and, and um, don't want to take part. Because we, we are basically a teacher of DIY installations. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, ever since Enphase came out with a product that you can just plug in, the, you know, plug it in, in the wall like you're plugging in a toaster and it makes electricity when the sun shines on it. You know, um, we we want to get that word out so people install it. We're one of the things in terms of working with Habitat, and this is probably applies to other places, is that, you know, it's very difficult, especially now with the prices of construction materials to for Habitat to finance a whole house. You know, uh, you know, the last couple of Habitat houses have cost in the range of $250,000. Well, that's that's a middle income house for most people. I mean, that's not that's not a that's not low income or, you know, at that point, it starts getting out of the ability of people to to afford it. And so while some housing component components have no payback, you know, if you uh, if you think of you know how many how many components how many times do you flush a toilet for example before it has a return on the investment um, that's something that we just you know so what we're providing is something that pays back fairly quickly you know compared with most other you know countertops or flooring or you know many of the finishes that go into a house. Um, and the other thing is that one of the advantages for Habitat is that they only have to front the money for the few months before the rebates are refunded instead of decades for, you know, to mortgage a house. So, you know, one of the things is that more families stand to gain because the, there's not so much time involved in land purchasing or permitting or developing, uh, getting, you know, doing all of the process of, of buying property and building houses. 
Um, one of the things that we provide is that we have the experience in choosing the best hardware for the money. Uh, we have the purchasing experience and the and the wholesale contacts, um, and we have ex we have installation expertise that we've developed. and And through the last dozen years, we've trained a lot of people. You know, in and again, we're not talking about complicated. These are not NABSEP certified trained people. Um, they know how to put the array up, but if you look through the you know even the NABSEP apprenticeship program, it's there's only two questions that really apply to only just the installation of the array. So we don't need quite that level of skill uh, to be able to do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was a question in the chat about, are you getting any pushback from local installers? I saw Robert responded, but I thought you could just do it for the video portion. Um, okay. have, have they looked at you as a threat in any way? To some degree, to some degree, I'm sure there probably is some of that, but there's nobody serving this area right now. There was, there is a new company that's just developed here, and probably, but these are, these are companies that get most of their money on on big systems. They're not looking at a 12 panel system, you know. They're looking, they're looking for doing McMansions, and so that's where their profit is. They want to be able to go to a job and stay on site for a period of time, and 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 put in lots of panels for them and charge. And it's one of the reasons that we also feel that we're doing a service is the fact that we're giving people a, a comparison. We're keeping, we had one guy who came down, he was a, a utility lineman uh, and he was putting, he was putting a, an array on his farm and he came to the rural electric and said, hey, I'd like to do this. I've got a, a company who's willing to sell me all the hardware for $58,000. And he and he are put in the system for fifty eight thousand, and he and the the customer rep at the co op said, um, you know, we kind of like to take the local guys if we can, and so he he referred him to us. We sold him all of his hardware for eighteen thousand instead of fifty eight thousand, and he and his he and his son in law put the system in with absolutely no trouble. So, you know, now his, his son-in-law was also an electrician who ran, did the home run work, but, but so there's a certain amount of just keeping people honest because we have a lot of these big out of town solar companies coming in and doing just really unconscionable work. Uh, we have a house up the block that was done by these guys and it was, it's, it's tree locked. It's shaded constantly. I don't know how much he paid for this system, but I it has to be a very large amount. So yeah, we do have some pushback, but mostly, and I think that what we've also gotten is that we've had the freedom to go in and talk to people in, in the legislature in terms of improving um, recognition of the benefits of solar to utilities especially the rural electrics. Um, that's been somewhat successful, uh, somewhat not. Um, they still vision themselves as being part of, you know, like in the same batch as the big boys. And they they kind of like to think that they're a big utility, an IOU. So they take a lot of their, their, their policy positions from, from, uh, from the the big local IOU investor you owned utilities. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we've had a we've kind of had a disproportionate disproportionate influence compared with our size just in terms of bringing up topics that wouldn't otherwise be covered. Um I I, Bill, I just had a thought as you were talking on that. We're doing a project here in southern Ohio. And I just wonder if it has synergy with what you're dealing with. We're looking at putting a hundred, uh, we're kind of, for lack of a better term, calling it solar on the on a pole. You know, uh -huh. they're ground mounted, single pole, six panels to a pole, up to two of those poles for low income housing. And we're just talking about basically micro inverters assembled pretty much off site, brought in, stuck in the ground, connected to a utility disconnect at the meter, never even having to go inside the house. 
And I just wonder if this is something I, that could be replicated because you're not climbing on roofs, you're not doing all it, it's it's a niche for a small group of homes, obviously, but but it feels like it's kind of a nice little assembly line project. We would love to hear more about that. I think that sounds like a really good idea because the it's easily repeatable. Um, it would be easy to, to train people to do it. Um, and like you said, it gets you off the roof. I think it's a great idea. Yep. Yeah, the other thing that we've built into this is because the new combiner boxes, I know you said you didn't do those, but um, they they communicate or can communicate through cell modems. So you don't even have to deal with a homeowner's micro um, or uh, Wi-Fi. You know, you can just set it up, monitor it from a central location. Uh, and um, it just feels like it. all you need is an electrician to come and stick a, a utility disconnect at the meter so that you can tie into that breaker, uh, which is now required by code anyway when you upgrade the electric. And uh, But, uh, you know, so that's kind of what we're looking at, but I'll certainly share that as it moves down the road. I would love to hear more about that. We, you know, we had a farmer who put in a, a large array on his hog farm, um, oh, probably 60 miles from here. We provided all of his hardware. And he it was about 700 feet from his house. And, and it wasn't line of sight. There was a, there was a, a, a shelter belt that ran between his house and the, um, and the, the array. So it, it was not line of sight. And his choice, his choice was to either drive down there and connect his laptop to it or to use a cell modem. And that got him into the, into the cellular fee, the monthly cellular fees, which were kind of high, at least for him and his program. Yeah. Yeah. The cell modems that N, uh, N phase sells as part of their combiner box, the, the service is included in it. Um, really? But the fee for the modem is is pretty high. I'm thinking it's like 400 bucks for the little modem, but that that includes you know multi year. Uh, I don't know if I haven't looked into the details, but it's certainly more than five years, maybe maybe even ten years of of cell connectivity. Okay. that sounds way better. No, I would yeah, love to hear good. more about that because you're right. It would get us off the roof, and so it would limit our liability. Yeah. And it would be something that these soldiers could do. You know, it's something that could be repeated. And it's something that we will be needing much more of as we get into the Solar for All program. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Well, well, we're gonna we're gonna have about 10 minutes here. So I wanna make sure you get to the to everything you wanted to cover in this in this okay. session. Okay. The you know, one of the things that Habitat would bring to us is, again, it brings consistent trade management. And it, it's also, they, they're they very accountable to their national um, organization. They Liability insurance would be covered through Habitat, and that's huge for us. It's also, they might be the warehouse because they could keep it in the restore building. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, Habitat can already has an access to low income families and they have they have staffing to be able to to sort through who who qualifies and who doesn't so that really makes it easier for us to approach um the population segment that we want to work with uh, we've we we find that many of our people who approach us at this point are McMansions. uh they're people who have very large houses and they just want to have a you know they want to buy it wholesale and then have us install it. Uh, yeah. And yeah, we we installed a system on a habitat house, and after about a year, they looked at the the numbers, and it's they um, it, it was just twelve panels, but it was generating like fifty dollars a month worth of electricity, and the loan to buy the equipment with, with the do it yourself system was about twenty five. So it was servicing the loan and making. Tw about $25 a month. Um, so that's when Habitat just said this, we got to put this on lots more houses. Yeah. But well, I don't know I, why you're talking about Habitat, except that, Bill, are you thinking that that if somebody was starting a co-op, they should look into Habitat too? 
I think it's a great match for for the whole. I think the models match really well, regardless of where it is. I'm thinking okay. it would it would match in Manhattan. We do have the we do have the benefit of having the the exiting soldiers who could be doing a lot of the work, um, and that's not available else anywhere else that I know of. But but okay, there's all kinds of job course and and training programs and community colleges and other places that could easily do this. So yeah, I think that's why I'm, our organizations seem to dovetail really well at this point. Hey, this is this is just a real quick thing that I wanted to mention that, and I wanted to bring this up because it's something that we've kind of developed here locally. And it's, it's something that we're seeing all over the country. Um, you know, the utility, the investor owned utilities are all saying, hey, you know, the solar doesn't really contribute much. It doesn't, you know, it's the residential class peaks slightly later than the system. Um, and so the, so our legislature, for example, has all, has limited um, the, uh, the payment, the utility payment for, uh, for excess power going back onto the lines to just the cost of fuel, which at that time was 3.4 cents. It's probably 2.5 cents now. And the other thing, the other thing that is consistent refrain that we have from from the utilities is that distributed generation customers are not buying enough electricity to pay their full fixed cost. This is a quote from 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 their from the last hearing before the Corporation Commission. And so we're we're cross subsidizing other being cross subsidized by other utility or residential customers. And I and what I'm about to say really mostly has to do with with summer peaking utilities as opposed to winter peaking utilities you know new england you know the northwest or the you know all the northern tier states probably have higher peaks in the in the winter than they do in the summer but for all of us in the south you know the south of nebraska probably or maybe and it's moving north you know as as it heats up we're starting to get more of this i mean portland oregon had had peaks, you know, 90 degrees, 95 degrees. At one point, they were uh, maybe even broke 100 last summer. So this kind of applies to other people as air conditioning becomes more of a uh, more of a thing. But what we found is that the concern is for is peak demand, and that's the utility. It's the most expensive part of any utility's um, operation. And if they can if they can dispense with that a good portion of that by having distributed solar, then they don't have to upgrade the size of their of their uh, substations or their transformers. They can they can basically place size all of their infrastructure around more around the base load as opposed to the peak load of their of their system. And this is and this is from a, this is the load profile of our utility through a day. Um, and it shows the top row is critical, you know, critical peak days where it's over a hundred degrees. And the bottom one is just the average peak. But if you, if you look at those numbers, solar, even without, even without, um, even without storage or demand management, it, it reduces that even at seven o'clock in the evening, it still reduces a lot of it. This is the really expensive part of the day. I mean, this is the part that utilities groan about and why they have, you know, the air conditioning management uh, thermostats and things like that, and why they're talking about the time of use pricing. But if you look, and this is taken from Kansas's rate, uh, Kansas's big investor owned utility, Evergy. And there, they have a pilot program with the Kansas Corporation Commission on time of use pricing. And so in the afternoon, it's, you know, here from one o'clock until seven o'clock in the evening, it's 16.3 cents a kilowatt hour. And then there's an intermediate peak that the utilities never mention. It's 11.2 cents. And it starts at 10 o'clock in the morning and goes until one o'clock in the afternoon. So what we're providing is really valuable. I mean, there's the solar generation profile. So 
what we're providing is really valuable electricity, which if if the people if if we provide excess, it just goes to the they sell it for retail to their neighbors and save a big amount of money. And the other thing is that in terms of storage, because that's becoming the big topic, in the morning it very closely fits to what the the load. If you shifted that load with a very small amount of storage, you're probably talking, you know, maybe 3.3 uh, kilowatt hours of storage. Uh, it's not a big system. Would completely fill and make everything that's generated into peak load power, which is worth a whole lot more than what they say. Another thing is that we hear this from utilities all over the country is that sunshine is intermittent, so it's unreliable. But no, we checked with the we, we checked we took downloaded all the data for 2009 and two, no 2012 um, from the Kansas Weather Data Library, and we went through and sorted between. All those days that were all the hours above 100 degrees, and 93.3% of them were absolutely no clouds. They were totally clear. And another 4. Point, almost 5% were scattered clouds, which means 37 to 50% uh, cloud, only 37 to 50% cloudy. So, you know, while it's un, while it might be intermittent, and and you'd have to be a fool to argue against day and night, but Solar is incredibly reliable and, and predictable and, and predictable. predictable. Exactly. A few days ahead of time. Exactly. So this is something that as we get into peak electric rates, you know, and and time of use pricing, this is going to be incredibly val uh, valuable for people to factor in and, and for all solar proponents to be able to say, hey, wait a second. You know, in Missouri, it's now going to for a ratio of four to one in terms of the time of use pricing in, in Missouri, this it's already started. So if the base price is 7.2 cents a kilowatt hour, the peak price is going to be, actually it was close to eight cents per kilowatt hour. Then the peak price is 32 cents a kilowatt hour. So, you know, those, those, those graphs showing that, that if we could be included and, and actually, the sorry. Actually, the Supreme Court and the Kansas Corporation Commission said that we could be that we would be charged that so distributed generation customers would be charged you know could join any rate plan rate plan except time of use pricing. So anybody else can join time of use pricing, but not solar customers. <laughs> so that's backwards. Backwards. That's yeah. an exact, that's a, a total admission that, oh, wait a minute, we'll lose money if we let, let these people be on, on time of use pricing. So those are, I think those graphs are really important. And you'd probably have to, if you wanted to use the same comparable information and comparable data to talk to your own people, your own local legislators and your own people, then you'd probably have to modify it to fit the load profiles of your utility but at least in Kansas, and I think we're, you know, we're in the middle of the country, so we kind of are a good average. It probably applies to everybody, Nebraska South and all across the southern states all from, you know, Florida to California. So anyway, if you guys have questions, please ask. Yeah, Bill, could you stop sharing the screen too so that we can get the their videos up online. And I'll just mention, because uh, there's been some people in the chat asking, uh, this video will be up on the YouTube channel, the Blue Rock Station YouTube channel and LinkedIn through uh, Solar Noon Tuesday. So anybody have any any specific questions for uh, Bill or Robert here? Uh, Pete, go ahead. Hey, Robert and Bill. Your uh, emphasis on small systems um, really dovetails with, with my interest, which is solar electric for domestic hot water. And I was glad to hear that it was chilly in Kansas this morning because uh, it's very easy to put up a diversion load of an electric space heater for the surplus. You know, if you're putting up the arrays, the rest of the wiring to go to the water heater with a controller is pretty damn simple. 
so I would hope that we could communicate and uh, maybe your people would, especially those on rural cooperatives, which you, um, it was mentioned earlier, our non tool cooperative on grid time, <laughs> or electric for domestic hot water and space heat. There's no grid time part of it. So the cooperatives, they're going to lose that business with no say so in the matter for hey, those customers hey. who adopt it for, for heating applications. Excellent point, Pete. Hey, one of the things that we are finding, and Enphase has this as part of the programming for their inverters, is that you can set it, you can set the inverter to no export. So there are, if if the utility is absolutely uncooperative with what you're doing, it's possible. We had a guy who was uh, who is an electrical engineer in you know uh, somewhere close to here. Uh, who has had his on on no export, and there is no actually I know of a couple who are who the utility has no idea they're on the lines because there's no ripple, there's no effect on their system, there's no there's no consequence to the utility. It's the same as insulating your house, same as as right. you know any other energy efficiency thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and we we also did find out we we compared that to putting a house on, uh, <clears throat> but not controlling the you know where it goes. So it, we we turned off everything in the house, put on solar panels. All the electricity went back through the meter. We were testing to see what the meter would do if it would run backwards, if it would stay still, if it would increase, even though we we're selling back, and if the utility company would notice, or if the utility company cared. And they noticed, <laughs> and they cared. And cared. <laughs> yeah. So, That's but right. the no export, the one you know, there was you, you know, with a with a gateway, you know, um, end phase gateway to be able to control zero export, they didn't notice. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to make a point though that for heating applications, is DC direct, so there's no cost for inverters. So there's that issue too, as far as the cost of the system. Also, oh. as far as a no export. You know, that implies that the customer is at home, whereas for domestic hot water and space heating, they don't have to be there. It'd be helpful if they weren't on vacation for a week, but if, if they weren't home that day, the water would still heat all day. I think that's a really good point, Pete. Yeah. Hey, there is another another load that I think is really making huge sense. There was a report that just came out by the uh, European Solar Energy Agent. Uh, I, I'm not sure who, who it was. I'm, I, I'll have to get it for you if I, to find out who it was by. They found that in in Germany it would reduce the that if they combined heat pumps with with a, a, with PV that it could reduce the the electrical use by the household by 62 percent, and in Spain and and Italy it was it dropped to like 30. 30%. And I can give you the actual numbers for it, but it, it was a remarkable study. Okay. So okay, well, heat well, pumps I'm, with uh, solar. Pete, I'm going to have to interrupt you there because we're yeah. going to have to come take this to a close. Um, but I appreciate it. I want to thank uh, Bill and, and Robert for jumping in here and telling what's going on there in Kansas. And um, if you guys do need to get a hold of them, uh, you can contact me and I'll put you in touch with the uh, with Bill and and Bill will be the gatekeeper for Robert if uh, you know so we're we're all gatekeepers here. It so works. Anyway, so yeah. uh, thank you, thank you everybody, and we'll see you all again uh, next Tuesday at noon. Uh, and appreciate your attention. All right. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye bye.